Uh, I'll give you a quick overview, essentially in a three-part presentation. I'll give you a quick overview of, of RICS, the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, and what we are up to, and go through some of the thought leadership work that we are doing as a professional body, and we look forward really to engaging with not only the audience in this room, but also beyond the audience in this room to, to global, global platforms as well. We've chosen green cities and finance because I think as we've heard in the presentations this morning, and one thing I've heard from the Dubai 2020 presentation, this idea of future-proofing the city is, is immense. And it came through some of the JLL work on that shift from retail to logistics, because a lot of the work that we do is about retrofitting, and a lot of the retrofitting work is the finance for that retrofit, but also the shape of that, of that retrofit as, as we move forward. So hopefully all of this will make sense to all of you. Um, very quickly, Rex, you, you're, you're probably all aware, uh, celebrated 150 years old uh, last year. We are, I believe, the largest professional body in the UK by member numbers. We have in excess of 138,000 members, which probably makes us bigger than the three next professional bodies all put together. So we have that critical mass, and with that critical mass of members, we are then able to hold solid impact around the world, which is really important for the work, for the work that we are doing. Um, where does our thought leadership come in? So our vision changed, if you like, that shift between 2017 and 2018, and where before we focused on enforcing professional standard and regulating the profession of the surveying uh, industry, we now want to also, in addition to all of that, effect positive change in the world, which is really important, because that is core. We believe it's core to what the future profession, if you like, will be about over the next uh, 20 to 30 years. How do we do that? So we have a series of uh, outputs which some of you, again, may be, may be familiar with. Uh, we, if you like, uh, accredit the education of surveyors in higher education. Uh, we uh, provide data and insights which are trusted by the profession. And we also produce professional standards, which we want a lot of organizations, government, municipalities, uh, to adopt. Uh, and through that, if you like, we then begin uh, to articulate the outcomes that, that come out of our uh, outputs. Making that positive impact, and more important, it's a positive social impact for cities, for people, for cities, for governments, if you like, for communities, more importantly. Uh, and through that, as an outcome, it's the pioneering the better environment uh, piece. Okay, now why do we want to do that? Why did we create that shift of vision from 2017 to 2018? It's because as we've heard this morning, the world is changing, the world is facing major, major challenges. Now, one of those challenges is the switch from retail to logistics, but actually the bigger challenges that we think the world faces have been articulated very cleverly at the UN last week and this week with the climate action with the Climate Action Summit. Um, and we've heard from the previous presentation, the urban population of the world is increasing. So it is an increasingly urban world. And when we look at the statistic, that shift and that loss of natural environment is immense. And actually it's beginning to have an impact on the future shape and form of our cities and the behaviors of our citizens and therefore the interests of, of policy makers and decision makers. Uh, and with that comes this need for more power, more food, more water, okay? So power will be coming from energy, particularly will be coming from different sources. It will increasingly be coming from renewables, whether onshore, offshore, 
or alternative energy sources, including solar. Water, you know, I come from, I come from Jordan, uh, and essentially water is a huge problem. We don't have that much of it in Jordan. And the little that we have, actually we're not that great at managing as well. So we tend to lose a lot in transportation. So we don't understand our networks. And I think one of the future pieces of work that we want to do is a, and it was mentioned very briefly this morning in the presentation from Mott McDonald, is to be able to understand and map better our networks so that in a digital world, we are then able to manage those networks more effectively in the physical world. And that's relationship between the digital and the physical will become a very important, if you like, in terms of what the surveyor of the future does. Um, the, the other issue which came up is resilience. Uh, we are facing a lot of shocks and stresses. Shocks meaning those sudden flash floods that appear at an instant and take a lot of people along with them. And then we've got the stresses, which are the long-term, if you like, transportation problems, the long-term availability of disused warehouses in our, in our cities. So these are challenges that municipalities and governments have got to deal with. And together with private investors and the profession, they then have to find clever and imaginative solutions for. So those solutions, if you like, um, for me at least, and for us as a, as a professional body, have to come from partnerships with a, lot of, with a lot of organizations. And I've listed a few here. So if we start from the left, the city budget. Our, our cities have limited, generally they have limited budgets. So they have to work within what they have, and a lot of those budgets are ring-fenced, meaning they cannot be used for innovative projects where the cities want, want, want these. International aid. At the moment, there's lots of it. It's very targeted to particular causes and particular crisis responses, and not necessarily innovation, innovation driven. Capital markets, markets again, as we've heard, they'll go where the outlook is generally very positive and yields and returns of investments are actually high. And then you've got regional governments, private equity funds, commercial banks, and so on. So these are some of the people and some of the organizations that, that, that for me at least, they need to work together in order to fund those innovative solutions. Now, what could these innovative solutions look like? Mobilizing green investment. The difference there, as you'll see on the screen, is the difference between financing green and green financing. And they're two different things. Financing green is what the government can do, okay? By creating those long-term strategies and frameworks which effectively then set the scene and the capabilities and the environment, the enabling environment for the markets who want to green finance to invest in. So it's a partnership between, between the two, if you like. It's the government, the cities, local government, central government, they can improve access to finance for green products and green investments, but actually it's up to the financiers whether that's banks, whether that's the IFIs, like the IFC and the World Bank, and, and so on and so forth, all of the development banks, and philanthropy, okay? So they will only go into the green financing piece if that enabling environment is there, and only cities working in collaboration with central government can create that enabling environment for financing green. Uh, a good example, and I put this on as a good, as, as a, if you like, an, an ongoing and a growing uh, uh, piece of innovation coming from the Greater Bay Area in, in China, Hong Kong, and their investment in the green bonds. They managed to raise earlier this year in excess of one billion US dollars, and the aim is to, at the end of the day, raise something like 12 billion US dollars for green bonds for investment in infrastructure in the, in the Greater Bay Area. And if you want to know more, again, it's, you've got uh, our annual RICS. This is, this is for the, all those of you who are interested. Our annual uh, summit, the World Built Environment Forum Global Summit, will be in China. It will be in the Greater Bay Area. And we will be talking about this as a main strand of our work. This is in May 
next, next year. Um, priorities for action. So, what are, the key, what are the key takeaways for everybody here? What can governments, what can governments do? So develop that overall strategy for shared prosperity and set targets for net zero emissions. Fair enough. How do you do that? Who funds that? What does that strategy look like? Who needs to collaborate with who? Within municipalities, within local government departments, and with the other, with the other, with the other partnerships. Inspiring line ministries. Every single minister that reports to the PM is not easy. In fact, Asking the planning department to work with the transportation department, to work with the environment and waste collection department, and to work with the building control and building permits department in any one city is not easy. So actually, that, if you like, overall strategy, whether it is a green city action plan, whether it is a resilient strategy, is important. Who funds it, it doesn't matter. But actually, cities need to have those strategies in place because they are a key, a key building block. And the next one is the funding and financing urban innovation and urban infrastructure. Okay? And that's where you develop those, if you like, climate safe, bankable projects, which will then provide yields for the investors, but also provide benefits for the city, for citizens, and then local government is able to demonstrate that impact in, in, in return. Um, and I think because this is an urban world, that battle, if you like, that battle for the future will only be won in cities. As we've seen, it's an increasingly urbanizing world. So the solutions have to come from urban areas. That, that definitely is a must. What can you do as a city, as a local government? You could remove land use regulations. As a planner, you know, it's very... Sometimes it's very tough to say you need to remove those kinds of regulations, but actually you need to promote compact cities and you need to be positive in promoting those compact and, and livable cities. You need to work on your building codes so that they do promote net zero uh, carbon. You can offset if you can't reach those targets. It's not the end of, you cannot, it's not the, end of the world. You can buy carbon credits and you can still fulfill your, uh, your targets. Banning the sale of fossil pow fuel powered vehicles. Uh, the UK government had said they want to eliminate all petrol and, and diesel vehicles by, by 2040. Now, that's fine. Actually, you then need to offer people the alternative. In some countries, and I'll give you a good example, Jordan is another one of those examples. Jordan was selling in excess of 16,000 electric vehicles until the end of 2018. From January 2019 up until this point, they've probably sold 10 electric vehicles because they removed, the government removed the excise duties when, when the policy to encourage people to buy electric vehicles came in. They reimposed customs and excise duties on the 1st of January 2019 and people stopped buying electric vehicles. Okay? So sometimes government, and I do understand that, they have to balance income to the treasury, income to the budget, versus, if you like, environmental positive, positive action. And it's a tough one. It's a very, very tough decision. That decision is government. It is not for the city. And this is why that partnership between cities and the networks and companies and operators that run the road networks becomes actually very, very important. Uh, because if ultimately what we want to create are places that are inclusive and equitable, we need to work on that middle piece, if you like, that responsible decarbonization. And, 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 I, and I recognize, and I think a lot of us do, that in that shift to renewables, we cannot leave behind all those industries that are heavily reliant on, on fossil fuels. We have to look at the trade-offs. We definitely have to look at the trade-offs, and this is where those partnership workings become, become important. Uh, a quick word on SMART, because it, it came up, it came up in, the, in, in the morning, and, and Project 13, which was mentioned by, uh, by Luai from Matt McDonald, is a very interesting one. It's about building digital twins of our infrastructure. Okay, at Amir Rakami meaning that we're able to manage the infrastructure in a digital environment 
and then are able to respond in the physical environment. And that relationship between the digital and the physical is actually very important to us. It's very important to our way of working. But it's also very important, again, this is me going back to the future of the built environment professions, because we have to produce professionals that have the capabilities to understand all of this, but also have the capabilities to engage innovators, master policy making, understand data, and be able to work with other professionals as we modernize some of the infrastructure. If as JLL said, I think it was Craig who said, uh, Dubai's logistics infrastructure is old. Well, it can't be that old because uh, you know, it might be 20 years old. Actually, we're dealing with a lot of legacy infrastructure in some countries which is 100 years old, for example. And actually being able to understand that in a digital world is tough. But that's why building that trust and building that confidence is very important. And this is where the professional bodies, like RICS, are able to help. Because they are about trust and confidence through standards. Concluding thoughts for you, very quickly. Mobilizing finance, I think we understand that is very important. How do you mobilize? That finance is, is a challenge. Having worked on resilience programs, you know, we had lots of targets, and the targets themselves and the environments keep shifting. All of us now want to meet our sustainable development goals by 2030. Some people have different targets, but that's the key driver. If we want to build sustainable and resilient cities, we're always thinking of sustainable development goal 11. And then we need, to, we, need to work. we need to work from that. Governments alone cannot, if you like, um, fulfill the green finance commitments. It has to be down to cities. A lot of the organizations advocating this change globally are cities. They're the Global Covenant of Mayors. They're ICLE, the Sustainability Network. There's the C40, the Climate Action Group, and so on. All of those are city-based organizations. They are the key drivers, and they work alongside governments. U20, the Urban 20, always meets the week before the G20, those big industrial nations. And the innovation and the ideas are coming through from, from cities and city leaders. And that's where that work across the public sector, if you like, through partnership with the private sector, I think through incentivization at city level and at government level is, is the way is the way uh, forward. Urban mitigation and adaptation go hand in hand. Mitigation, if you like, how do we make things better the next time versus adaptation, which is, oh, we've had a problem, we need to respond to it as well. It's how do we understand our challenges? Do we respond after the event or do we prepare beforehand? But for us to prepare beforehand, we need to understand the vulnerabilities and the weaknesses in our system. For that, we need strategies. And for the strategies, we need partnerships. So these are the key building blocks, if you like, that we need. And we mustn't forget the last point there, which is the smaller cities. The smaller cities can be really powerful innovators and engines in a network with, with bigger cities. I always say the, the Netherlands Holland is a very good example of smaller cities working in partnerships with bigger cities through very excellent connections, creating a small environment and a hub for innovation through specialization, potentially. But also, it becomes easier to then leverage money for the kind of innovation work that we, that we want to do. Uh, thank you so much. Samar, Samar, thank you very much for that very powerful presentation. Um, I was going to ask you if uh, you're, you know, in a very brief form, if you're going to be, if you're optimistic for green cities of the future, but we haven't got a lot of time. Yeah, I, I am very optimistic. There's a lot of really, really clever people out there doing some very interesting things and actually working with finances and philanthropy uh, through the Global Foundations, Rockefeller Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, sponsoring some really clever bits of innovation, which I think, as long as they're able to then scale that up to the solutions that all of us in this room need, I think we'll be fine. Brilliant. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Shoot out to, uh, to Sam there. Thanks so much. Thanks, Greg.